here's the box we've one of the boxes we've jumped on is prototype we jumped on this box for about six years this is my primary runway we jump that way and we jump this way this way is a 110 degree box that way is a red box with white inner walls is 105. this box doesn't ever damage any poles it's got a lowered front lip it's got rubberized cushion edges all the way around the bottom is soft and cushioned and that's what really this is about we're just asking you guys to make this box part of your rules to allow it we're not changing it uh, we just want to allow this type of box that's what we're trying to do it's got six years of jumping on it i've had three or four kids land in it uh, every every result has been really good Hi, this is Peter Godinis, your host of Your Pivot Journey, and we are continuing our journey with Jan Johnson, who is my favorite pole vault advocate. So with that, Jan Johnson, one of the things I want you to describe is the process of implementing and installing the system that's going to make this safe. So welcome, Jan. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for, uh, thanks for helping me with this, big guy. You're really helping a lot. It's awesome. Former pole vaulters asking pole vaulters questions. I think it works good. Jim, this is an interesting uh, display. Why don't you take it from here and explain what's going on in this particular diagram? Well, this is a prototypical plant box that you see at the IAAF and USATF levels uh, with no box collar. And you can just see all the problems on this. First of all, it's, it's a plate steel box sunk in about six inches of concrete you couldn't make it any harder and then angles that are on the side and on the back uh, are from the rules of 1968 or 9 I think those rules came in and you can see the grinding spots uh, on the left side of the box top and uh, over on the left side of the sidewall there uh, and then of course there's a little there's less on the right because less poles bend that way because less people are left-handed. So anvil-like edges too, just you see this everywhere, these hard edges. Man, you couldn't, you couldn't make anything harder or less safe from a landing on its standpoint. Plant box has several problems uh, beyond just being hard. Uh, the front lip problem has gone on forever. Uh, you can see the elevated front lip here. This is just a little bit of elevation. You see ones that are way worse than this, but even this much elevation for those jumpers that slide their tip on the end of the runway and into the box, it, the tip catches on that little edge right there. Um, we need that to go away. We need to, we need to sink the box down about an inch on that front edge so they can attach it to the subsurface materials and it needs to have a, a, a downturn ledger on it uh, so that you've got a good area to glue with or attach with. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do there. Uh, this is our box collar that we designed. It came in the rules in high school and college uh, back in 2012 or 13, I think. Uh, we also worked on this project. Uh, it became a it became an ASTM standard. I didn't get exactly what I wanted on it, uh, although I was the original designer of it, but that's the way politics goes sometimes. Uh, it's just too thick in the middle. Uh, it needs to be rounded more at the back. Uh, but anyway, that's another story. Cool. So here's what the rule books look like now. There's actually uh, different rules for the box, but they all generally say the same thing for high school, college, IAAF, USA track and field, uh, and they all say 105 degree back, and they all basically say that the front edge of the box should be even with the top of the runway, which is what creates the front lip problem as the runway wears out or you have a poor connection on the front. Uh, they all say 105 degree end plate angle, and they all say 120 degrees. Uh, sidewalls, and that's been the way the rules been since 1968 or 69. In, in until 1924, uh, most pole bowling was good just planting uh, the pole, and typically they were hickory or bamboo poles, um, into a hole dug in the ground at the end of the runway. And of course, there'd be arguments about how deep the hole should be and all that kind of stuff. So in 1924, uh, uh, 
um, in the rule books that came out with this, uh, which was a 90 degree back, uh, the same length, the same width, and the same depth as the box is nowadays. Uh, so that, that kind of standardized uh, the depth of box is, should should be, and I think it's a good thing. Typically, in those days, it was a wood box uh, just in the ground at the end of the runway. Um, this is a general design for what we're jumping on here at my club uh, and at probably 30 other places across America. Uh, this box has a flexible tray. The tray is the side walls, bottom pan, um, in, in front edge with the stabilizer on the front edge integrated or attached to uh, a robust or a thick hard end plate. And what that does is it reduces the amount of uh, hard surfaces that you can land on. This type of box also has a, between an inch and a half and three inches of rubberized track surfacing on the top of the end plate, uh, which removes probably the most dangerous place in all of pole walling, that top edge of the box. Um, so um, this system also, you need to have markings around the box and you'll see that a little bit later. Um, here's a, here's a above view of what we're saying we should have, uh, 137 inches uh, by 54 inches wide marked cushion area subsurface around the box. We're also saying that you can round the ends and the corners a little bit of the box uh, to make it less likely that the pole is going to rub on it. Uh, the figure C, plant box dimensional ranges, uh, shows that we want to drop the front edge one inch. Uh, we're going to compensate the end plate uh, two inches for that, or I'm sorry, two degrees for that. Uh, and then we're going to add two more degrees. So we're saying that the end plate can be between 107 and 110 degrees. Uh, 107 or 8 degrees is, uh, is comparable to a 105 degree end plate when the front edge is directly on the edge of the box. The depth of the box is the same. The length of the box is the same. Uh, and this picture uh, very importantly shows how the back end of the box where the pole strikes with great force needs to have a concrete anchor. Uh, it shows that it needs to have an attachment bridge on the front edge uh, where it, uh, where it uh, contacts the edge of the runway. It needs to be attached to the subsurface of the runway, not to the surface of the runway. Uh, that's why it needs to be at least an inch down. Probably, probably three quarters of an inch to an inch is the best. And then the next picture down is what it would look like uh, as a profile um, um, in an elevated board runway. So this is the box we're installing. Um, you can see several things about it. It's got uh, rubberized track surfacing. Uh, that's the same angle as the top edge of the runway. Uh, it's, it's, it's curved a little bit, uh, and it's a flexible sidewalls and bottom pan with a, with a heavyweight uh, end plate. The yellow area is where the pull strikes and where the tip rotates. Those areas are going to remain the same so that the impact and the pressure developed by the, by the end of the pull hitting it there is the same as the current box. However, the sidewalls, the bottom of the box are all flexible. Uh, with, with cushioning underneath it. So uh, this is the one that we're generally uh, installing in places now for the last three or four years. Um, <laughs> usually when I go put a box in, I just put everything in the back of my Nissan Versa. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I don't see, I just, the only thing you can't see here is you have to have a jackhammer uh, and it's good to have a sledgehammer, but generally you can install a box with just these tools plus a jackhammer. So, uh, this is my brother-in-law and I, and we're installing uh, a box at Westmont College. Uh, they wanted to have a box on the other side of the track uh, in lane five, uh, way down at the end. It was an area that had a real good wind and real good environment um, and was uh, far enough away from the uh, end of the start finish line on the end of the straightaway. So first you have to go in uh, with a drywall knife and you cut out that uh, 37 by 
137 by 54 inch uh, runway surface off the runway. Important to measure it uh, and put it in exactly the right spot because once you start cutting that rubber off, you can't change it. <laughs> Here we're uh, peeling up the rubber surfacing. Most time the rubber surface comes up real easy. You can peel it right off the runway. You might need a shovel or something to kind of scooch underneath it a little bit and help cut it, but you can usually, everyone we've ever pulled up, it pulls up in one piece. Uh, and then uh, in the bottom frame, um, that's just with a skill saw. We're just, we're just cutting uh, with the concrete blade. This track was, had an asphalt subsurface, uh, but we're cutting with the concrete blade, uh, the perimeter uh, right along the rubber edges. It's important at some locations to have a, a good jackhammer. This is a 90 pound jackhammer, uh, which you can usually rent for 40 or 50 bucks for a day. Uh, you gotta have a jackhammer. Uh, like I say, this track uh, was an asphalt track. In the top picture, we've started chopping the asphalt out. Um, this is why you score the outside edge uh, with that with that uh, concrete saw, so that so that your sides are nice and straight, as you can see in the bottom picture. And here we're down to sub base on the track now. Most tracks uh, are, are are three or four inch asphalt sub base uh, or a concrete sub base. It's about the same thickness as the sidewalk. So. Here's, um, we, we, we put four bags, generally it's four bags of shredded rubber mulch. You can buy it for $3.50 a bag at any hardware store. Uh, and we pack the bottom of the box with it. We, we cut the box so it's 12 inches deep, or the box hole, so it's 12 inches deep. And then we fill it up to grade with the shredded rubber mulch. So, uh, here uh, we're, we wet it and we pack it three or four times, with just foot packing it with our feet too, just to give it a squishy yet pack stable sub base. Works really good, really simple to do too. Um, once we have established the grade, then we put the box in and we start playing around with the top of the mulch uh, so that it's uh, level on that, on that level, on that four foot level that you see on the bottom on the bottom frame. Um, it's important to step on the box like the guy in the top is showing uh, and make it where it doesn't rock back and forth. And you just do that by, by, by stepping on it and packing it and sometimes pulling the box off and wiping it down with your hand and just making it smooth on the bottom. It takes a minute or two, it's really easy. On the top picture, you can see the black line on the uh, top of the end plate there. Uh, that's where the shredded mulch goes to. And, there, and, and, and so when you're packing it down, you're packing it to that line. And then, um, and then you're gonna put uh, an additional uh, closed cell cushion on top of that. It just tells you the, where you need to be uh, from a height standpoint. Uh, when you get all that figured out, uh, now we're concreting, once we're certain that the depth of our box is the right depth. Then we uh, usually, we max up uh, one bag, one 90 pound bag of quickcrete uh, right in behind the box. It's important that it buttresses it. It's also important that it goes underneath the um, pole rotational area uh, two or three inches also. It just gives it that same firm feeling that pole vaulters are used to. Uh, and that concrete goes to that line uh, that I was explaining in the top frame. We're going to pour concrete to that line so that our depth is correct. Here uh, we've got our concrete in and we're just making some little adjustments. Um, you can see in the top picture, that's the rubber uh, track surfacing piece that's going to be on, on top. Uh, and the bottom picture is a, a additional piece of foam. That's EPS foam. Um, it's made for outdoor use. It's, it's a closed cell, so it doesn't absorb water. Uh, and in this particular install, we put EPS foam uh, on the back on top of the concrete anchor. Uh, that was then glued onto the anchor and then the uh, top piece is glued directly onto the EPS foam. Here's a couple, here's a couple other views of the same thing. You can see the EPS foam on top of the concrete and how it's all buttressed in with our box. You can also see how in that top picture how 
uh, the front edge is uh, between three quarters and one inch below the surface of the runway. Um, the bottom picture shows now that we have uh, put the um, rubberized end surfacing piece on top of the box and just lining things up. Bobby's now also uh, watering the uh, sidewalls one last time and packing the rubber mulch down in there so we can we can put the um, we can put that those pieces on the correct depth. Also, I think this picture is cool too because it shows we put a target on the bottom of the box. And uh, we have uh, EPS foam also uh, glued to the side walls in the bottom pan. So there's several layers of, uh, of, of protection here. Here we're uh, installing the last of the uh, rubberized pieces. I think the bottom picture really shows it. You can see how they're a different color than the track um, and uh, how we found the, the uh, correct depth of, uh, of the box because the uh, surfacing pieces around it uh, are at the um, upper surface level of the track. Looks good. Two more good pieces. Uh, when we get all the, when we get all the uh, rubberized top pieces in, we just glue them in with uh, rubberized contractor cement. You can buy that at any hardware store too. Uh, there are several types of really good, flexible, rubberized uh, construction materials. Uh, they all come in tubes like we show in the top picture there. And we glue every piece of this thing uh, to the perimeter and to each other uh, and gluing the front edge down. Um, it, that's, a, that's a great picture. It shows exactly what we did. Uh, yeah. Here, um, the glue is all dried and with my, with my uh, planer, I have um, curved the top of the rubberized pieces a bit into the corners. Those big curvy corners you see on the bottom is where the pole bends into and so much damage happens in there to the bottom of the poles. So uh, that's what that piece is all about. Here we're putting one final glue coat on it, uh, just assuring that it's in place. Here is the finished box. Um, they wanted it to be a different color and I'm strongly suggesting that the Plant, the cushioned plant box use area, which is all the yellow parts in these pictures, um, surround the box and be a minimum of this size that we show, which is 137 by 54 inches, a minimum of 12 inches of cushioned area from the top of the end plate to, uh, to the runway surface behind. You want 12 inches behind and three inches um, beyond the front edge on, on every front on, on, on the box. Uh, so that, that's the minimum size I would recommend. That's the size we're using here. Uh, and we're suggesting that when the pole vault is being done, that that is all the surface area of the box that you should see and that the pole vault pit should cover all the additional areas. Here's, uh, here's the same box at Westmont, um, what it looks like installed. And everybody knows in pole bowling, if you don't stake the back of your pit, your pit is moving backwards all the time uh, from run throughs and stuff like that. So, so that's what happens. Uh, now look at the bottom picture. The bottom picture really shows what the end plate anchor should look like. And, uh, and what the, uh, what the cushioned sidewalls and uh, bottom pans should look like. And that's all uh, shredded rubber mulch that's been wet, wetted and packed. And really after you get the thing installed the right way, it's uh, pretty easy to reinstall another box or move your box to a different location. Because once this anchor distance is set and fits your box, it's always the same. Action. Here I'm, here I'm just showing another method that we've used. Uh, this is shredded rubber mulch um, with, uh, with crack sealer, with outdoor crack sealer uh, holding it together uh, with cushioning on the edges of the box and, and uh, using crack sealer, uh, which is very, very sticky by the way, aerosol crack sealer to, uh, to uh, glue the front ledger into the edge of the runway. Here's the same box again. 
You can see the outward curves uh, at the top of the sidewalls here near the end plate. Um, and you can see that we sanded down all the crack sealer and we sealed it and believe, <laughs> and believe it or not, we sealed it with rubberized roofing cement. Uh, and it's still going strong out in this backyard. It's at least 10 years old. This is one of the first ones we put in. And here's the same box again with just a piece of uh, rollout runway cut to the shape of the uh, box. Yeah, we jump on this, this couple of, this set up here all the time. Oh, here's a couple more pictures. Uh, when, you're, when you're setting a box in the ground with wet concrete and everything, it's important to uh, have a counterweight, have a weight in the bottom of the box so that it doesn't uh, float up, which is very easy to happen, especially if you're concreting underneath the entire box, which obviously we're not suggesting, but that's why a lot of boxes are high because they put the box in and it's wet concrete and it floats up a little bit. So not, not a good situation. Um, anyway, these are just two steps on our process here. Uh, here we've taken an old, but this is the old, old style box collar that I first designed uh, for Gill Sports uh, back in 97 or 98 maybe. Uh, and I've just uh, altered the back of it a little bit with some vinyl uh, and some tape and some, uh, and some sticky glue uh, so that it fits a curved, uh, end plate and sidewall uh, design for less interruption with the vaulting pole. You know, in pole vaulting, there's uh, several different installs too. There's boxes at the end of the runway in the dirt, and there's boxes at the end of the runway in asphalt, and there's boxes uh, in an elevated runway. Uh, our system that I'm suggesting fits into all of those. Uh, all of those areas really important. Uh, so anyway, I just show in here the stuff we use to coat and seal this box and still make it flexible. So, so Jan, that was a really good explanation. It was a lot of detail, but very necessary uh, for anybody who's really serious about putting a strong foundation of a setup for a vault. I really like the way that you actually shared some of the cost because the cost is actually pretty minimal. Maybe the labor, maybe the expertise is going to cost extra, but it was, it's very it, it's very reasonable in cost. I really wanted it to be uh, to, to I want to make it where a coach or a couple of kids and their dad uh, or school maintenance can put it in. That saves a lot of money when you don't have to go hire a contractor to put it in. So we've shot videos of our installs. Uh, we've shot pictorials like you just looked at of our installs. It, 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 you know, it needs to not cost too much. It also needs to last a long time. Uh, the last a long time thing is why I've taken my time on it and have watched this progress for eight or 10 years now. Uh, I want the boxes to last. I don't want them to get cupped out on the bottom. I don't want to have front lip problems. All that needs to go away. We need to be able to plug it up uh, in an efficient way uh, when pole balling is not being done, especially when you're along the sideline of a, of a football or a soccer field or something like that. So uh, that, that's really what I've tried to do and, and make it where it works for people. Uh, the problem is, is that the box that I'm showing you, because of the angles involved, doesn't exactly meet the high school or college or IAAF rules. We're asking that they allow this type of box with these angles and these curves. Uh, I think it's the next step forward in pole vault safety and the progression of pole vault safety. We haven't, we haven't changed the rule for the box since 1969. That's a long time. People bend the pole a lot more. There's been a lot of injuries uh, landing in the box. Maybe you and I should do a talk about all our uh, all, all the work we've done on investigating injuries between Peter McGinnis, Barry Bowden, and I, and a couple others uh, to show the need that way. Also, so it's been a long term. It's been a long time project. Uh, I would not think of having pole vault here at my facility where I pay the rent 
and I pay the insurance and all those things and not have a cushion box. You know, Jan, I uh, just build on what you're saying. I think economics plays a big part of it, but safety, saving lives is even more important than the money. And, you know, to your point, 17 feet is about when people are hitting a critical zone. Well, I got to acknowledge the world record now, which uh, you so much share with me is what 20 feet, two inches by, you know, a son of one of your uh, trainees, uh, uh, Mondo Duplantis, and I guess his dad was Greg Duplantis, and you had trained him. So, Jan, the, the heights are getting up there. So um, I'm really glad for you is keep it safe. Let's save lives. Let's make that pivot from, from being a dangerous sport to a very safe sport. I appreciate that. Thanks a lot, big guy. Well, Thank we you. hope you enjoyed Jan Johnson's demonstration and how to implement and install a safe and a long-lasting pole vaulting box. If you'd like a digital version of the guide that Jan walked through, please click on the link below and we will gladly send that to you. So as a bonus good, I'm going to show you some of the effects of the abrasion that takes place on a pole when vaulting on a pit that doesn't have the insulation that Jan talks about. So enjoy the footage as I did as a former pole vaulter myself. Nice jump. Mm. A little bit on that one. A little bit. Now let me see the bottom of that pole. There it is. Yeah. So it is touching a little bit.